Okay. Oh boy. Hey, everybody, and welcome to the PC Gamer Show. My name is Tom Marks, assistant editor here at PC Gamer. Joining me today is Evan Lottie. How you doing, Evan? I'm doing fine, Tom. Our very own Tyler Wild. Yes, hello. And Wes Fenlin. What's up? Tyler, you sounded a little Russian there. That was a little... That's, I kind of have, yeah. There's a weird, like, uh, voice that, uh, that comes out sometimes when I talk. Well, barring Russian intruders into the stream, uh, we have a good show for you today. We're going to be talking about Overwatch, Steam, uh, excuse me, Blizzard's upcoming um, FPS. We're going to be talking about the Steam controller and possibly the Link as well, just our first impressions of those. Uh, we're going to be talking a little bit about the latest Hearthstone patch, but also as just as a segue into general kind of game balance and, and the things that revolve around that. And then we have a somewhat somber segment to, uh, to say goodbye to our editor-in-chief, Evan, who it's we, your last day today. We'll yeah. be killing him after yes. the show, yes. <laughs> Blood will be spilled. I, yeah. believe, I believe there was mentions of flaming arrows and putting you in a boat on the, into the bay. And That's appropriate. I'm, I'm partly Scandinavian, so I would em- embrace that sort of funeral. <laughs> there we go. So, yeah, we'll dig into it later. It's my last day, PC Gamer, after seven years. Oh, wow. My, oh, my goodness. Um, my first job here out of college... My only job ever. <laughs> I've, I've only ever written about video games other than, like, working in a grocery store since uh, when I was in high school. So, anyway, before I get, like, way sentimental, let's just talk about the games we've been playing. That would be, that'd be a lot easier for me. Well, just so you know, my goal is to make you cry uh, during this stream. It's not so. going to be hard. It's a cry stream. <laughs> Uh, and then, of course, we'll be taking your questions at the end. But first, let's do that. Let's talk about what we've been playing. So, Evan, what have you been playing lately? I'm going to give you the same answer I've given many, many a stream, many a podcast uh, throughout the many episodes of the PC Gamer podcast, Tom. That's Counter-Strike. No way. Continue to play Counter-Strike, uh, my favorite game over the past year and a half or so. And, yeah, it continues to be fun. I'm, I've been playing casual mode with the voice chat off, and it's been blissful. Yeah, I also gave one of my friends. He uh, lives over in Atlanta, actually. Your, your area. Yeah, I'm from Atlanta. Wes. And I, I gave him some skins because I noticed he, would, he was playing. That was a big mistake because he sent me a <laughs> Facebook message this morning saying, this is addicting. I need more skins. You might have just ruined his life. I, I like, legitimately, he doesn't have a job right now. Like, it's... <laughs> oh, God. I did a bad thing. Why did you do that? The I'm first sorry. taste is free, guys. But I guess, you know, we'll, we'll be digging into this later on, but I've been tinkering around with this Steam controller in our living room. Wes and I live together, and... Uh, playing some platformers and FPSs and trying stuff out, so looking forward to talking about that. That was one of our most read stories on the site over the past week. People obviously want to know what this controller is all about, what, what Steam Link is all about. Does it work? Does it? What kind of compromises does it introduce? So it's been fun getting a sense of that. I'm curious with Counter-Strike, uh, have you been playing less with your crew just out of a desire to be le- play it less as like a serious competitive thing and more of a just like wind down, you know, uh, I just want to get in a little Counter-Strike? For sure, yeah. I think... You know, a lot of your a lot of your rounds when you're playing competitive Counter Strike, you just die. That's, I mean, maybe that's just me. I'm, I'm not I'm not a perfect player. It's me, definitely. <laughs> but in, in casual mode, yeah, you, you have that capacity to rack up four kills around or something, and that, you know, creates a different kind of experience. It's more relaxed, obviously, and uh, you know, not everybody in casual mode is, is is as great as they are in competitive. So you get to beat up on people. It's fun. Mm-hmm. Pub stomping. That's why Evan's leaving, actually. He's gone casual now. <laughs> <laughs> I, I hate that term used that way. I apologize. It's fine. The yeah, rumor mill begins. Only real casual gamers play Counter-Strike. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. It's interesting that there probably is a large subse- subsection of the Counter-Strike like, player base that only plays that way, right? Like Absolutely. You, you've been entrenched in the competitive side, but there are probably a lot of people where casual with the mics off is just how they play. It's probably the majority. Yeah. I mean, it's the, it's it's hard to say exactly. I mean, there's there's no shortage of people in the matchmaking system, and you know if you go on the Counter Strike subreddit, it's definitely what's being talked about, and it's definitely like the center of that culture. But yeah, I think you know the average player is probably intimid- intimidated by a matchmaking mode, and Valve doesn't exactly put it front and center. Anyway, tell me about what you guys have been playing. Tyler. Yeah, yeah Tyler. Well, uh, I played a game that's not challenging at all yesterday, which was the conclusion of Tales from the Borderlands. Was it a challenge to keep yourself from crying? Uh, no. There's <laughs> you, some emotional moments, yeah. Wes. You weren't, are. you weren't too emotionally invested, though. Uh, no. But I like the characters. I li- I, that's my favorite Telltale game up there, like modern t- 
Telltale Tales. So post, post Walking More so Dead. than Walking Dead? Yeah, I never really liked The Walking Dead that much. I mean, <gasps> I did when it first came out, and we were all just like, what is this? What is What has Telltale done? This is an unusual game. Like, I was into sort of the excitement around it. But uh, I, I just don't really like The Walking Dead as a thing. Zombie apocalypse crap. I definitely feel that way about the show. But yeah. So what, what sets Borderlands apart for you? Uh, I mean, it's the funniest game uh, that they've done. Uh, not that Game of Thrones or The Walking Dead are really We're intending trying to be, be hilarious. <laughs> but uh, I, like, I like comedy. The characters are good. I don't care about Borderlands as like a universe. I find it just to be like, its sense of humor is, is like, look how wacky this character is. Tiny Tina, wow, wacky. Like, <laughs> she says funny things. I don't know. It just, it's not really my sense of humor. It feels really like, uh, I don't know. I don't know what the word is. But, there's, but there's a lot more sincerity, it seems like, in Tales from the Borderlands. Yeah, there yeah. are, like, the lead characters are, like, you know, not defined solely by how, like, goofy and crazy and out there they are. They just... Psychotic. Yeah. <laughs> they, they just have, they're just kind of, like, people in a bad situation who, yeah. who like, don't necessarily have ambitions to rule all of Pandora or anything. It's just, it's funny, good good character. Some of the characters, better than others. Um, some of them kind of feel just boring. And not all the jokes are good. Like, they do a joke, a really extended joke about how, like, the corporate Hyperion guys settle everything with gun fingers, which Spaced already did a long time ago. Oh, yeah. It just feels like, eh, like, that's a throwaway joke to me that they spend, like, a huge long s- sequence doing, but... Oh, the jokes are really good and funny. I really liked the finale, and I'm writing a review of the whole season uh, right now. I know you you were saying yesterday like it was kind of hard to to try to review the entire season together just because one, it's been a long time yeah. since you played it, and two, I'm guessing some episodes you like more than others. Was, I know I've never really reviewed a whole series. It's kind of difficult because you can't buy individual episodes. Um, right. It's definitely easier to like play an episode and then write your thoughts on it. Um, but I'm going back to like this time last year when the uh, first episode came out as far as trying to collect my thoughts on the series as a whole. So it, it does a few things new with Telltale's formula, but not a lot. Um, so that's probably my biggest criticism is that Telltale's really stuck to what it does since The Walking Dead. I'm glad at least the Tales from the Borderlands let them kind of go back to their older DNA where before they had this explosive popularity with Walking Dead, they made funny games. Yeah. That was like kind of all they did. They made little adventure yeah, games. Sam and Max. They did Sam and Max. They did their own Monkey Island and that mm-hmm. kind of stuff. And that was that was what Telltale was all about. And then they got kind of roped into this very serious business, dramatic storytelling thing. Yeah. So I'm glad that they got to break out of that a little bit. Yeah, it almost was like that the success of The Walking Dead like pigeonholed them a little bit into, oh, we got to do more stuff like that. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. So I've been playing uh, a little bit of Killing Floor 2. Tom and I actually played some last night. Man, I forgot how hard that game is. Yeah, so neither of us... I I had dabbled a little bit with the, the Incinerate and Detonate pack, I think is the name of their first kind of big update to the early access version they put out. I'd played that a little bit, just like in testing some mice and stuff, because the game feels so good, the aiming and stuff. But I hadn't really dug into any of the perks. And Tom and I each played one of the new perks. I was playing the Firebug, and you were playing... The dem- Demolitionist. Demo, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, I like the firebug a lot. I don't know if it's quite as, I don't know if it's underpowered compared to some of the basic perks like Commando, or if it just takes kind of it has more of a learning curve. Because you start out with a really nice close range flamethrower, that's kind of the, your only weapon early on, that and a pistol, and it's not nearly as powerful as like the Commando starting with a, a rifle and being able to just headshot guys left and right. So I had to kind of save up and get the the trench shotgun but it's a like inflammatory trench shotgun so when you shoot zeds they explode into little fireballs uh, and that was really fun Hmm. and then the final weapon for it is this like microwave cannon that just shoots like a laser tendril at stuff uh just like a yellow beam of light It's, it's like kind of like playing ghostbusters with zeds so that's that was pretty cool um and the other game I've mostly been playing the past week is uh, Galaxy, which is finally coming out on PC end of this month, and I got an early build of that. I've been playing it with both the controller and the keyboard and mouse controls, which they designed, obviously, for the PC version. 
and I've been kind of shocked how good it feels with the keyboard and mouse because I expected that to be kind of just a tack on like okay technically we have to have this but like some game like Dark Souls where you just can't play it with a keyboard and mouse unless you're a masochist or something yeah isn't it a twin stick shooter well the the original game uh, with a controller it's not a twin stick shooter it's a one stick shooter uh, but it's it's very physics driven. Everything mm-hmm. is is about the physics of your ship and the physics of things you shoot in the environment. So you have to be looking, you have to shoot in the direction you're looking. So a lot of the moves are based around like there's a button to s- kind of do like a strafe jet off the top of your ship, so you can kind of do quick circles and you can turn around very quickly and you can do forward thrust and reverse thrust. So getting good at the game is a lot about being able to do acrobatic flips and like shoot forward while you're thrusting backwards and something's chasing you and that kind of thing. So with the mouse, you can turn really, really quickly and precisely and aim, but then you also have to keep in your head what direction your thrusters are moving you based on the orientation of your ship. So if you're forward thrust, but you rotate your mouse, you'll go from you know moving north to moving south and you have your side left and right, you know, like sliding jets that you can use as well. But if you're oriented and, you know, looking down, they're going to move you in the opposite direction as if you're looking up. Sounds so. like you're qualified to enter the Air Force at this point. Yeah, it's a lot of mental mental mathematics. I don't know if I am quite as, like, skilled as, say, someone who can pi- pilot a helicopter in Arma, but... Um, that's easy. I've been uh, trying to wrap my head around it and definitely like fumbling with the controls some, but when I nail like a firefight and do really well in it, it feels super satisfying. So I'm digging that. Very cool. Yeah, it, it's a it's an intriguing game to me because it's one I hadn't heard much about and now it's like everyone I've talked to who's already played it is like excited about it. And they're they're adding an arcade mode for the PC version, which is basically what the original game is except taking the roguelike structure out. So all the missions you go on are still randomly generated uh, and all the environments are randomly generated, but when you die, instead of having to restart an entire season, which is five missions in a row, you can just restart at the mission you were on. So you don't lose all of the weapons and stuff you accrued. So I've been enjoying playing it that way and kind of getting better at the game. And then once I clear the whole game on arcade mode, I'm going to go back and start doing it in roguelike mode and have that the extra tension of, you know, finishing a level and going into the next one with one HP and like having to try to get through a whole season that way. Cool. Well, I actually, I, I've had this weird thing happen to me lately with games where I've, for probably the past like month or so, maybe a little less than that, I have had almost no desire to play any single player games and also play any multiplayer games alone. Like, I didn't really have a desire to play Killing Floor, and then you were like, you want to play Killing Floor? And I was like, yeah, I do. Or when I see friends on playing Heroes of the Storm, like, I want to play that with them. But So I've played a bit of Heroes of the Storm, and I've been playing a little bit. I started to jump into Dungeon Defenders 2, which went uh, entered the free-to-play part of its early access just recently. Um, and we had Trendy, the developers, on the show a while back, and they were showing it off when it was still... Uh, you had to pay to get into the early access, and now they're kind of moving towards getting out of early access. And that game, uh, it felt a lot like the original, and but, like, way just more polished and better. And, like, it, it's such a pretty game. Like, regardless of the gameplay, it's just a really, like, gorgeous little thing. Um, but I haven't had much time to dive into that. Um, I've just been, like, I've been having moments where I've just, like, I played 30-plus hours of Metal Gear Solid Five, and then I, like, just stopped playing that game, and now I just don't want to play a single-player game right now. Like, I'm not sure why exactly. It's I, it's not that I don't like single-player games generally. It's just not my interest right now. Sounds like you're becoming a real grown-up, Tom. Uh, I know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> With real adult things to do. I'll put away the Pokemon and stuff like that. <laughs> no, actually, I, uh, I, I a lot of my time has been spent the last like week and a half. I picked up this little tiny little mobile game that I was making, um, to like teach myself how to code. And I like started it a year and a half ago and then I just finished it this past weekend. So a lot of my time has actually been making ga- a game rather than, than playing, which is exciting to get back into, but let's move right along and talk about overwatch. So last week I wasn't here. Evan heroically took over as the host of the show. Um, and I was at Blizzard HQ for a day playing Overwatch uh, before the beta. And I was the first time I'd actually played it. 
and I got to play it for about three hours, and I, like, it was fantastic. Like, I really, really, really enjoyed my time with it. So, Evan, I know you've played it at, like, BlizzCon and other cons, and PAX, right? yeah. Yeah, and PAX. Mm -hmm. And Tyler and Wes, you guys haven't yet. I, I know so little about Overwatch beyond it's a Blizzard game with, with guns. Really? Yeah. I mean, I, I know the, the very, the basics, but, yeah, I don't know. For some reason... I just haven't had the desire to follow it. I feel like it'll be a game that'll come out and I will play it. And until then, I'm kind of it's just been, content with knowing. Been lots of cinematic trailers, world building, you know? I Blizzard, love that. Blizzard's though. good at that yeah. stuff. You gotta know the stories behind the characters, Wes, and dude, get excited before you play them. Dude, I used to have the Warcraft 2 manual, like, memorized because I read <laughs> the lore in that thing so many times. So. I mean, it's fair to say, you know, just watching Twitter and watching forums and Reddit, there's a lot of enthusiasm for this game. What I'm curious about, Tom, are two things. Yes. You got to play some, I don't know if you touched all of the new characters or like the recently announced characters. Uh, I played, I played Roadhog was one of the mm -hmm. recently announced. I did not play the other guy, the bomb guy. Okay. So I'm curious, well, but you probably got to play against them at least. Yeah. What you thought about them. And, and just secondly, if there's anything else that really surprised you about the experience that you weren't expecting. I know in your write-up, you didn't necessarily say that, like, it's not TF2, but you didn't compare it very closely to TF2 and what you wrote last week. Yeah. Um, I Well, I think that the TF2 comparison is easy to make because you look at it and you're like, oh, it's yeah. a capture point game. It's a payload map. Like, so that's real, and it's class-based, and everyone can be the same class if they want. So there is, it's easy to make those comparisons. But the thing that, surprised me was that when I was actually in the game, it just felt like a different game, right? Like, it's hard to describe that, but it's the same way that, like, Battlefield doesn't feel the same as Call of Duty, right? Like, they're both shooters, and they both have similar goals, but they're just, like, you play them differently. Your goals are different. Your, your things you're thinking about are different. I think one of the things that struck me is it doesn't have the same sort of Quake DNA as TF2 does. I mean, very literally... You know, it began as a Quake mod, Team Fortress. Uh, but down to stuff like rocket jumping, I don't know if that's a specific mechanic yet, but that sort of emphasis on, I don't know, for, for I'm generalizing, but like real skill shots, like arena-style skill shots. Overwatch has some of that, certainly. There are definitely skill moves you can make, but they feel a little bit softer, a little, a little and I'm not saying it's more a more casual game at all. I think there's going to be plenty of opportunity and, and space for a lot of competition, but there's something about the the precision you have to exercise in TF2 and the amount of like you can jump off walls you can you know sticky bomb stuff you can turret jump and stuff like that those kind of acrobatic maneuvers you can make I'm not seeing that feel very very PC to me right like sort of exploiting little glitches in the game to do weird stuff things that may be even started as glitches that have just over the years been codified into exactly. a movement style in a in FPS exactly I don't think that spirit which I think is an important aspect of TF2 in the grand scheme of things is present right now in Overwatch from what I've seen. The vibe I got was that it is, but only on specific characters and only specific elements on specific characters, right? So like uh, Farah has the rocket jump and the jet pack so she can boost up really far. And the new guy, I can't remember his name, um, the junk rat, that's what it is, the kind of grenade launcher guy. He has a thing where you can throw down a landmine and then activate it and jump boost himself. Okay. So... There are specific characters who have these very, like, have those elements to them, but yes, you're right. The game as a whole doesn't, but, like, they kind of just concentrated it in, and it felt a lot, I didn't get into this in my write-up, but it felt a lot like every character was, like, Blizzard was, it, it, uh, if, if they were just like, okay, what if we made a character based off of this shooter, right? And then they made it. Right, right. So, like, Soldier 76 is, like, what if we made a character that was Call of Duty? Because it has a sprint button, and it has a, like, basic machine gun and an auto-aim thing and stuff like that. And then the turret guy and Mercy the healer are very TF2. And then the... Jeff Kaplan, the game director of Overwatch, actually told me that McCree, the kind of cowboy guy, he has a revolver. Uh, I was talking to him about McCree, and he was saying we wanted that revolver to feel like Gordon Freeman's revolver in in T, uh, in Half-Life. Yeah. Like, they wanted it to have that weight. So it feels very much like each character was, like, inspired by some other shooting game, which is why it doesn't feel like any one of them to me. Mm. If you play Farah, she's going to feel like Quake, because you have a rocket launcher and you're flying into the air, right? But 
if you play, you know, Roadhog, it's not. If you play Roadhog, it's going to feel like Heroes of the Storm yeah. almost. Uh, well, well, that way of framing it definitely feeds into what I've known and felt about the game in that they're just focused on let's get a bunch of crazy fun mechanics and variety in there and we'll figure out the balance later. And that sounds like really flippant, like Blizzard doesn't care about balance. <coughs> but in talking with them, they've stated to me explicitly that that is not their, like, number one priority. They're not approaching the game saying, like, whoa, 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 let's... Let's like start from scratch here and really think clearly about like how to make things super fair. Like they want the game to be fun and interesting and, and wild first and foremost, and I think that's a good approach. And balance, especially in a shooter, feels like such an overused, maybe misused word. Where it's like, is TF2 sniper and all of its possible loadouts balanced with the soldier? In what way would you describe that? Yeah. Um, I mean, how would you how would you measure that anyway? Obviously, it's clear. It'll be clear if one character is like simply the best character and, and everyone rushes to it. But. It's it's an unfortunate complaint. I mean, the reality is all competitive games evolve over time. Yeah. Like, es especially the biggest ones. They're going to change dramatically. I mean, TF2 is a very different game over the past eight years, even over the past two years <laughs> from what from what it was. And uh, I think the, the genius of a game like TF2, not to just continually compare it, is they embrace... Valve embraced those opportunities for rebalancing, however you want to put it, as opportunities to sort of get people out of their comfort zone, you know, where, well, we noticed that, yeah, engineer players at the outset of TF2 are playing very defensively because, as it turns out, they have a turret that takes a long time to build, and they have to, like, go get resources and ferry them back and forth, and the game is based around capture points. So, yeah, they're going to defend, and you have to repair it, so you have to, like, sit there, and that's kind of boring. So mm, let's... Uh, change give his engineer like a smaller turret that can be rapidly deployed that costs fewer resources give him some guns that lets him kind of net like run in the field a little bit more and then other classes that are used to dealing with a defensive engineer have to like completely change their tactics and deal with this new style and that's you know that's a more fun game for everybody because it changes over time and uh you have to reinvent yourself you have to cope with new situations and new maps and stuff like that so and it breaks up just the existing overly successful tactics that everybody knows about, you know, which, which get old after a year or six months. Are there now more people playing TF2 than, than ever? Like, is that game, did it peak at some point, or is it still just... It's, they're not, I do not think there's more playing than ever. Uh, I think 2012 was the peak. I, I did, I looked into this for my reporting on uh, the state of CSGO a few weeks ago. I can't remember off the top of my head. But Maybe around when it went free to play, it was was potentially the biggest I think the item economy around that time I can actually look it up while we're while we're here but but it's still extremely active oh absolutely you know? I, I mean it's, it's proven if you want your game to last for 10 years <laughs> work on it for 10 years and people yeah, will keep playing it it will and be valve is also a big part of that I think and as soon as overwatch includes a, a tribes-esque character we know Tyler will start playing <laughs> <laughs> me and Evan will jump in yeah <laughs> Tribes still, still like something I want to. I don't know. I want that to be huge. Well, well high hi res has has gone back to it, and who knows what? Yeah, they're working on it. You know, maybe they're just going to keep it on life support, but that's better than nothing, I guess. It's kind of what it sounds like. Yeah, it's better. Yeah, it's better than what they were doing before, which is absolutely nothing to it. So, and it sounds like they want it to be at least a little better than it already is, which is nice. But what's cool about this life support is that it kind of they're just sort of treating it like with a small team willing to just try yeah. anything. You know, they've been, I haven't looked at the test server in a couple of weeks, but they were, you know, they were on the subreddit talking about all kinds of balance, balance changes um, that the community has wanted for forever. Um, and, and Evan made a good point that, that you know, when you talk about balance, it's um, aside from the obviously overpowered stuff that occasionally happens, it's about making sure every role is fun and also fun to play against, right? So, I mean, one of the things with tribes is is trying to trying to make sure it's fun to use spin fusers, which are its sort of uh, you know most important weapon or should be, but aren't you know maybe weren't really in ascend. So, anyway, I'll stop talking about tribes. There was a period when it came out where every single episode of our uh, podcast was gotten to long discussions on tribes. And I don't <laughs> oh my gosh. Repeat that. <laughs> that was several it months. Was every week, yeah. Uh, wow. But yeah, real quickly, TF2 is doing well relative to what it used to, but its peak was definitely, it was like August or September 2012. 
I'm not sure what that correlates with, but it was either free to play or big item economy stuff. Well, could that have been when they launched the um, the man versus machine mode? Because that was a few years ago, right? Mm, they did that after that was, they went free to play. I think though. that was 2014. Okay, okay. man, yeah. isn't that recent. <laughs> yeah, that was an long ago. Maybe late 2013. Anywho, what, um, what an evolving weird game. Uh, and but one of the things that I think is really important that I wanted to bring up about Overwatch actually is, you know. Blizzard has been really cagey about the payment model so far. They haven't said if it's going to be free to play. Like the th important thing to understand is everybody is always just like, "Oh, it's free to play," right? Like it's going to be free to play. Like they just assume. But Blizzard has a free to play game. They have in in Here's the Storm and Hearthstone. They have a pay once game yeah, in Starcraft. Yeah. They have a subscription game in WoW. So like, you can't look at their past games and assume what they're going to do for this next one. But one of the things that they have said is that all of the heroes are available. You don't have to buy heroes, like in Heroes of the Storm or like in League of Legends. The cast of characters that they are making for Overwatch are available to everyone. Wait, which to me, From the start? Uh, I, or I, that you can earn them? I believe it yeah. is they don't want people to be limited in mm -hmm. their hero pool mm -hmm. because they're doing a similar thing to TF2 in that if they make a character with a big shield, they want to make sure they have a character who can get around big shields, right? If there's somebody is doing one strategy, they want you to be able to switch mid-match and go to a strategy that counters that. And you can't do that if you don't own any of the counters to those characters. Yeah, I guess so. But there's also, there's what, 16, did we say recently? 16 or 18 characters. It's one of those two in Overwatch. It, right currently now. there are 18 mm -hmm. uh, that they've announced. So that's double TF2. Yeah, so, yeah. and it's going to be much harder to balance mm -hmm. for sure. But there's also, I mean, I, what I'm saying is there's more room not to advocate for this. There's more room for them to pursue something like everybody gets these five or these seven or they're like a couple rotating free or whatever and then, you know, these are paid or, what, or something. As long as they don't put in a dude with a knife who can turn invisible, I'm happy. <laughs> I told this, I literally said this to the developers at Blizzard. I was like, there's, they've been teasing, they've, like since they announced the game, they've had that kind of white, like robot cyborg thing with the green katana. And I looked at one of the developers and I was like, real talk, please don't make him turn like, invisible. I know what that is. I know what that means. <laughs> they added... I've seen one of those. They added, I think it was Phantom is his name, to Dirty Bomb, right. right? Who's the guy with a sword who can turn invisible, and I stopped playing Dirty Bomb. Oof. That guy killed me a lot the last time I played Dirty Bomb. <laughs> it's like, it's it's only fun for the person playing that character and no one else. I have a huge distaste for invisible knife people and shooters. I I just can't take them. <laughs> well, invisible knife people. You know, we, That's the name of my indie band. <laughs> we, we had a lot of praise for Dirty Bomb, and I still think it's a, a very good shooter. I do too. I didn't mean to disparage no, it. There, no, no, yeah. no. You're welcome to. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> Just disparage away. <laughs> well, no, but, I agree though. It's still fun though. I do kind of think that was a case where, I mean, they, they sort of just, not copycatted, but like threw that, that archetype of character into a game that didn't really have a lot of hard counters to those mechanics. Mm -hmm. I mean, the pyro is a fucking spy detector. Yeah. You yeah. Know? He is this engine that breathes flame and like, Snu literally snuffs him out. Uh, and he's a hard counter to that, and there are various other hard counters you can talk about, sticky grenades, and uh, even the way sentry turrets and certain bottlenecks can be used to sort of block and, and sort of corral spies, depending on what kind of spy they are. But Dirty Bomb doesn't have that kind of, you know, rock, paper, scissor relationship between any character. It's just like, well, you can shoot him, or I don't know, there, there are like, Central, uh, proximity grenades one of the characters has and yeah. I guess that helps a little bit but uh, to, to throw that kind of very powerful yeah, mechanic invisibility in, into a shooter like Dirty Bomb without any kind of interconnected relationship between the other characters kind of, kind of a mistake and, and I think they, they ended up actually nerfing his invisibility and making him more like translucent and then mm -hmm. at that point, it's kind of like, what's the point, though? Yeah, but, yeah, yeah, it's like halfway. And that's why it doesn't bother me. This is why the spy doesn't bother me as much in TF2, because I still hate the spy as much as that character in Dirty Bomb. But then I can just be like, you know what? Fuck this. I'm playing Pyro and just start literally anytime anybody yeah. comes within two feet of me, just tap left click, right? And then it's okay. Totally. Um, I Having played a bit of Dirty Bomb, um, not, not as much as you guys. I've probably played like six hours or something like that. I, I don't know if it's just because I'm have, I'm not committing myself to it in the way I did like League of Legends back when I played that, but I really didn't like the that MOBA like buy characters model in a shooter. Something about just there being such a variety of 
within classes specific like superpowers you know whether it's um yeah. calling in an airstrike or like i don't know what most of the powers do and have no chance to use them because i have like okay i technically i have a sniper but it's not like this other sniper character or i have a medic but it's not like this other medic character that plays totally differently and i'm not going to spend 20 hours like grinding to unlock those characters or put a bunch of money down just to play as different characters just to kind of figure out how they play and figure out which ones work for me. I don't know if it's just a difference between the typical MOBA model and the FPS model, but it's just not something I'm willing to do in a shooter, I don't think. So I'm glad Overwatch is not going to take that road. I'm, I'm very glad with it, and I, I enjoyed all the characters. Like, you asked earlier about the new characters that I played, and I actually, Roadhog, one of the newest characters that they announced, was one of my favorite ones to play. Um, he had, like, a shotgun... And then like a hook ability. Yeah, so like Pudge or something. From... And and they they very yeah. like much addressed that. They were like, it's a blizzard, it's a big fat blizzard character, so we gave him a hook ability. Like <laughs> that's what they said. Um, it's what we do around here. Yeah, and then he has like a heal, and he also has I think the most health of like any character they've announced so far. So he felt very like strong, where you could just like run up to the front of a team fight and pull someone in and as soon as they got in range you just immediately left click and they'd be dead because you have a shotgun and so as, as soon as they're close to you it's done um yeah so he was really fun i'm excited to see more of the characters they come up with i'm also excited to just see the story in general and how that unfolds because jeff kaplan said that they've got a lot of plans for that they're announcing some stuff at blizzcon for how the story is going to unfold in the middle uh, in the game um and part of that is that he said they're excited for what they have in store for the story for the next couple of years so they're prepared with what they're going to be telling like they they are not thinking short term in 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 overwatch's world building which is really exciting to me because that's one of my favorite parts of the game actually Hmm. Given the success of Hearthstone, just the absurd amount of money they're making off that game, I'd be shocked if Overwatch wasn't free to play following the the Dota or TF2 model of just cosmetic items being the primary money maker. Yeah, I'd be surprised if it wasn't free to play also, but I think that there is definitely potential for it to not be. Um, I think that it's not going to be subscription based, but I think if they announced, hey, Overwatch is thirty dollars, you know, and you buy it once and then you get updates and all that sort of stuff, I wouldn't yeah. be surprised. I don't think that's what they're going to do, but I, I wouldn't be surprised if they went more of a CSGO-style um, payment model. Yeah, and, you know, one of the things, again, I feel like I'm advocating for total capitalism at this point, <laughs> but the reason CSGO costs 15 bucks, sometimes it goes on sale for 750 Smurfs, you know, Smurfs and alt accounts uh, and hackers. You know, if the game is free suddenly there's basically no barrier to just creating a new account every time you get caught for cheating or caught for bad behavior or something. and Or just when you want to beat players who aren't as good as you. Yeah, and, you know, 15 bucks isn't a ton in the grand scheme of things, but it, that barrier is at least a, a starting point for discouraging people. And, I don't know, that, that might help, depending on the amount of focus there is on, on like, hardcore competitive play and... How, how rewards are sort of doled out through that system in Overwatch. Yeah, but Blizzard has had a lot of experience dealing with hackers. Oh, yeah. Like, they've, they've, they've been around the block probably more than any other developer in that sense. And I think the answer is to look at a game like StarCraft II and really invest a lot in expressing, like, the pride a player feels over how, how much they're climbing that ladder and their improvement and the statistics and the accumulation of all that sort of personal data and expressing that in the game over time as sort of showing your history of, of playing and improving um, Hardcore players don't want to lose that. That's, that's like, as valuable as anything, so. Uh, before we move on to the next subject, we've gotten many, many lovely uh, mentions in Twitch chat about table tapping, and I think they've called for a complete hands-off of the table. <laughs> oh, wow. Uh, the know. table tap emote is now trending, I think. So if you're touching the table, don't. It hasn't been an issue before. All right, Wes. Well, we get it. <laughs> there we go. So moving <laughs> you on. You can't stop me. Speaking of hands-off going to hands-on... Let's talk about the Steam Controller. Boo. Oh, boy. Yeah, you like that transition? I, 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 this is my day job, okay? I'm good at it. Um, you guys have used the Steam Controller. Uh, Tyler, have you? Okay, so it's just Wes and Evan. Yeah. I have not gotten my hand. I've touched it and been kind of like, <laughs> eh, about it, and I haven't actually used it. But I saw an awesome tweet uh, of Evan's of Wes just like 
frustratedly playing Killing Floor 2 with it. Did it include when I said this is garbage? I believe it, it did, did, yes. It did, and you swore as well. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you're not a fan for FPSs. So I think, I mean, it, all of our discussions uh, of the controller should be you know, taken with a, two things in mind. One, Valve has said multiple times, we are still working on the firmware for this thing up through November like 10th or yeah, something like that. They've actually somewhat awkwardly like embargoed reviews. Like yeah. we can't have an official verdict on the controller until they've rolled out all these patches and improvements and stuff. So they're still fixing issues with it for one yeah. thing. And then the other thing is it's definitely a controller that's going to take a lot of getting used to. One, because it controls differently than the game pads we've been using, you know, for years and years and years, dating back to, you know, basically the Xbox One controller DualShock era of, you know, early 2000s. Uh, so there's just a big period of adjustment there. So you mean Xbox Classic? Yes. Xbox Original? Yes, the <laughs> Xbox. OG Xbox Fat, yes. Yes. Uh, the Xbox One, not the Xbox One. Yes. Okay. Man, those black and white buttons. Wow, what a what a I weird miss them. what a weird design decision. <laughs> that was a weird decision. And the the bear shape and size. Like they were important. Husky in, controller. They were important in Halo, weren't they? Those were like the grenade buttons or something. No, it was like flashlight. And uh, it, you would change your grenade type with it. That's, that's what it right. Was. That's right. Um, so there's a lot of adjustment we have to do for that. And then on the like the software side, they have a lot of different configurations for how you can. Uh, both like how the touch pads actually function as well as like sensitivity and that kind of stuff. Uh, and I think for a lot of games, you're just going to have to tweak that, that stuff and find what works for you. Cause it's not going to just be turn it on and it's going to work like magic. Like it's something you're going to have to adjust to play it the way you want it to work. And on one hand, PC gamers should be used to that, be comfortable with that to an extent. And on the other hand, that is compl a completely different experience than any other controller I've ever used in my life. For sure, yeah. Where you expect to plug it in, it's going to detect, it's going to work, it's going to work with the menus, the sensitivity is going to be roughly right. I might have to change it, like inversion or whatever, but it, it goes, you know? <laughs> and that wasn't necessarily our experience with Steam Controller in the couple times that we've definitely not no. used it. I mean, uh, you know... And again, these are our personal issues, you know, maybe specific to our PC setup and whatever, whatever. We're not saying that they're widespread or anything, but I mean, we, we plugged it in. We, we had like two of them in our home setup and we were streaming from your, uh, our roommate Norm's PC upstairs. And when we went into we the- We tried a couple PCs, I think. We yeah, used mine as we well. We actually yeah. used three PCs eventually. But anyway, on one of the ones we were using, we went to type in a- a game name in the, in the store search just to like download something and it was detecting on your PC upstairs the the mouse input on the cursor so it was like constantly fighting our steam controller input within like the virtual keyboard to just plug in letters and it was like no I'm I'm a you know it's pulling the mouse and the controller input simultaneously and it was just a struggle to write anything like we couldn't yeah. do it and unless there was a ghost or something upstairs yeah. just totally <laughs> yeah. fucking with us yeah, that was obviously was static. just a weird and yeah weird so, incompatibility so just thing. like glitches like that we had issues where we went to play well we went to play duck game which is a cool uh sort of competitive platform or weird slightly like, smash Bros. -y, yeah but not really yeah. and and some other game i can't remember oh uh gang beasts yeah. So yeah, we're trying to play some local multiplayer games. Like this is you know the right stuff for it, and we had like an Xbox 360 controller plugged into our Steam Link, and that would detect, but not the Steam controllers, or detect like some of the Steam controller buttons, but not others. And I think I think there was an issue where it was detecting like the Xbox controller as player one, right. and a Steam controller as player one also. Yeah. And they were clashing that way. And there was no clear clear like imp, uh, UI to represent like. This controller is player one. Like we couldn't figure it out. We had to just give up basically. But a lot of that to me sounds like software problems. And yeah. and software problems yeah. to me are like the easiest to fix, right? Because mm -hmm. they can patch and they can they can figure out bugs and stuff like that. What I want to know is how did like Obviously, you said it didn't work very well for FPSs, but like, what about the other end of the spectrum? Did you guys try like an RTS with it? Like, did they 
in trying to satisfy both of those markets, like abandon both of them basically or fail both of them? Or? We, we haven't yet. And also I think there are some people who've spent a lot more time with the controller than we have so far who aren't as negative on its use as an FPS. And I think that, again, partially comes down to actually adjusting the input type to find one that kind of works better. When I was playing Left 4 Dead with it, the sensitivity was just really, really low for the, the trackpad feeling. So like trying to aim, it was kind of like trying to use a mouse with like an oven mitt or something because you were kind of just like constantly moving it too slowly or moving it kind of like jerking, you know, too too fast and overcompensating and missing, you know, trying to go up for a headshot and then you kind of swing up into the left or something and miss, or you're, you're kind of rubbing your thumb on the touchpad like multiple times, trying to kind of just coax the cursor up into a position. Uh, so I think having more experience with just how you're supposed to move that thing and finding the right setting, uh, I think a lot of people don't hate it as much after they've been using it for a week, you know, versus at the, the time I was just like, I can't I do just, this. This I sucks. I just have a hard time seeing where it fits into my life at all because it's going to be pretty rare that I'll play a shooter with a controller. There'd have to be some weird... I think the only thing is, like, playing GTA Five. I switched between mouse and keyboard and the controller depending on if I was driving. I did that shooting. too, yeah. Yeah, because driving with a mouse and keyboard in that game isn't great. But, so it'll be rare that I ever, ever want to play a shooter with... Um, with a controller, if I'm playing something like Civ V or an RTS of any kind, I kind of like the experience of being up next to my screen. There's a lot of little text to read usually. It's not something I feel like I want to play on a TV. So when it comes to putting games on my TV, it's going to be like Gang Beasts. It's going to be like party games, platformers. That kind of thing feels good. Um, Maybe like a big RPG. I guess. Um, Maybe, I think. But those don't typically require, like, super precise input unless it's, like, Dark Souls. We're seeing, and we're seeing more games of that type also being designed with a controller in mind. XCOM is a good example. Uh, Wasteland 2 just came out with the director's cut for consoles as well as PC. That has native controller support. Divinity Original Sin's director's cut controller support. You know, obviously The Witcher 3, right. so... So if you take out sort of like the RTS stuff where you kind of need a mouse replacement or a mouse and the shooter stuff where I don't like controllers, then you end up with games that already work fine with conventional controllers, and that's what I'm used to. Like, I would... I mean, a fighting game, you know, if you're going you're gonna to use a fight stick or, or a conventional controller, um, I don't see how the Steam controller would help there. I think the analog stick on the controller is kind of a telling concession... Yeah. to cuz in the original design there was not an analog stick it was all about yeah we have these two touchpads it's this really innovative kind of hybrid way where you can handle it like an analog stick or like a mouse it can do all these different things and one of the things that i found strange using the controller was how many elements of like menu navigation and stuff that you couldn't use the left kind of D-pad replacing touchpad for, you had to use the analog stick for it. And it was almost like the analog stick had become the default method of controlling, you know, your, your general movements and menu stuff with, that, with your left thumb, not the pad that they spent two years, three years engineering. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, we played a good amount of Rocket League, split screen and uh, multiplayer online. Uh, and we played a bunch of Spelunky. I didn't use the track pads for either of those. It felt fine. It felt good. It felt like 95 or 90% as good as a 360 controller, which I can chalk up to just comfort and what I'm used to. I guess one of the other distinctions in those contexts and platformers where you don't really have to use the track pads, racing games, you don't have to really use the track pads. Maybe you do. Probably not. Anyway, uh, the, the, the button diamond, the ABXY buttons are like, 80 or 85 percent the size of an xbox 360 or xbox one controller they're smaller yeah right mm-hmm. and i think that's a mistake uh they feel too small i don't have exceptionally big big hands or anything <laughs> and uh i kind of just you know it's not like i wasn't inaccurate it's not like they were like hurting me or i was struggling you just sort of notice how cheap they are and the control itself doesn't feel cheap it feels like a 50 dollar controller it doesn't feel like a hundred dollar controller but I just sort of started noticing that, that I'm mashing like the whole area around the button as I'm hitting A or B instead of the button itself. I don't have a lot of love, like wiggle room necessarily like I do on a 360 pad where I can sort of flick the edge, you know what I mean? To sort of like tap something rapidly 
Uh, it, yeah, that, that, that was one of my big disappointments. I mean, there's, there's also a, a part for, and this is me speaking as someone who has not used the controller, but there's a part of me where if somebody was like, we made a controller that'll make it feel like you can play a shooter with a mouse, but you're using a controller, and I'd be like, oh, cool, how'd you do that? And they'd be like, we put a like laptop trackpad on it. I'd be like, I don't want to play a shooter with a laptop trackpad either. Like, I mean, it's more, it's more like a trackball in the way you use okay. it than, than a trackpad. Uh, it's not like you're using, you have this small circular area and moving your thumb around that area covers the entire screen. Mm-hmm. It's more like using a trackball and you're, con- you're doing constant motion gotcha. and using momentum and stuff like that, except there's no ball. It's, it's you know, a slightly concave cup. So I think for, for, you know, strategy games, that kind of thing, there is potential for, you know, once you get over that learning curve for that to be pretty cool. I don't think it'll work well for like fast paced really accurate stuff like you will not play starcraft on this thing you will you will suck yeah but maybe something like i don't know if dawn of war is a great example but one of those rts games where you have fewer units they're bigger you're not doing a lot of micro as much micromanaging you're not your base building isn't kind of like i'm gonna build you know 50 buildings in really close proximity it's more like these macro structures you're building i think there's potential for that kind of game to work really well with it i guess gta might have been a good example to in in the way that if if Valve can make a controller, whether it's this one or another iteration, that means I can play like a third person action game like that and be able to go from like a driving segment to a shooting segment without having to put down a 360 controller and and get on mouse and keyboard. I tapped the. Uh, um, but I was <laughs> gesturing. I was Damn gesturing. Um, yeah, like if there were a solution to that, a controller that you can use for like vehicle stuff, like in Battlefield. For example, although I really don't mind piloting um, helicopters with a mouse and keyboard in that game, but I just crash into the ground. I don't know. Me too. I mean, <laughs> really? That's what, no, I guess I guess I, ne- I would never play a battlefield with a with a controller either way. I think one of my other disappointments about the controller, we can talk about the Steam Link, which I think we're happier with, is it puts a lot of onus on the community to build up these profiles that are very precise and and work. And those don't exist yet in great quantity. Like, there are a handful of Left 4 Dead profiles, it seemed like, and no profiles for stuff like Gang Beasts that we were trying to play when, you know, we were basically getting it as it was released to the public. So that's kind of to be expected, kind of not. You would hope that, like, Valve had been given this to developers so that they could build good profiles or, like, a good, op, you know, set of profiles for different people. Um, but also the the menu that sort of houses and contains... Uh, those user-created controller profiles, which again are like button mappings and sensitivity and stuff like that, don't really do a good job themselves of saying on the surface, like, this one is... Pick me. Pick yeah, me this one is like blank. absolutely the best one if you are left-handed or something. I don't know. Like, they just sort of have a name and I think like a rating or something. And they don't kind of... Um, you have to sort of just trust like, well, everybody in the community likes this one, so I guess it's right for me. And then, you know, you, you jump in and you're wrong and you jump back to another one like... That's not a great experience for me. I, I wish there was sort of more, a better way of categorizing that stuff. But and like like you said earlier, that this is you know this is Valve's first kind of big foray into the physical right and hardware. Um, and the Steam controller people have been pretty kind of like either mostly I feel like lukewarm on like it has some uses. It's not so terrible, but there's all these problems that we've been bringing up. Um, but the Steam Link, which you also got to try, which is their little $50 streaming box, has been getting much more positive reviews and impressions so far. Um, Wes, you said it is like works like surprisingly well for $50, right? Yeah, I mean, the, the hardware is exactly what it needs to be to get the job done. Like, I, I haven't broken one open and looked inside it, but you can tell basically what's in there is... There's probably a heat sink because the thing's heavy, but it's just a small, you know, board similar to what you'd get in like an Apple TV, but they built Wi-Fi onto it. They built Bluetooth onto it. They put in a few USB ports, HDMI, and it has a, it has a video decoder to handle the video signal coming in from your PC and probably just a tiny amount of memory and processing power to handle uh, kind of its like initial menu layer before you get into the uh, the streaming thing. <laughs> Sorry, I, saw just, you the I table. brushed the table and Evan was like, <gasps> <laughs> <laughs> so so the, Very the the hardware is 
exactly as good as it needs to be to handle that you know 1080p video signal coming in at 60 fps no no dips no issues with that it doesn't heat up and like drop performance or anything uh, but that's like 30% of the equation for Steam and home streaming. And the rest is, you know, what's the latency like? What's the user interface of Steam Big Picture like? And I think that last category is where it still needs a good bit of work. The actual streaming um, in terms of latency and performance for most of what we've seen is pretty damn good right now. I mean, when you're over a wired connection the Steam Link latency to your client device can be like 0.1 to 0.2 milliseconds, wow. which is nothing. You're getting, you're probably getting like 10 milliseconds of input lag on your monitor, unless you have a really high refresh monitor, and you're going to get some input lag on your, you know, your, just your control inputs too. So that that is like n no one will ever notice that amount of latency. Obviously, it's not that good over Wi-Fi, although you can still play games over Wi-Fi in, in ideal situations. Like I found, uh, I think I played Killing Floor over Wi-Fi here at the office and it worked right. shockingly well, like yeah. no perceivable latency. I played another game uh, that I did have some latency issues, but I think that was more like the PC I was streaming from just started to chug, so. And just to translate that, that latency into like what you think of as game ping, I think that's one ping, right? One millisecond? Or point yeah. 0.1 millisecond might even be less than yeah, that. It's tiny. Point yeah. 0.1 millisecond might be point 0.1, like, ping. Because, and, you know, people, at least pros, are always say that you don't really, like, notice, like, like server ping until, like, maybe around, like, 40 you start noticing it. Mm -hmm. So, like, the fact that it's significantly smaller than that is, is it's basically just non-existent in, in when plugged in. Yeah, it's an achievement. I mean, the, the fact that, you know, we had like a couple issues here or there where like it would hitch or there'd be a moment where you notice a little bit of artifacting, but it works. Uh, it didn't, it wasn't hard to set up at all. It was very easy to sort of authenticate your PC within the house. You just put in like a simple, basically Steam it's like card. a four-digit code. Yeah, yeah, it's like a, you know, two-step authentication type thing. And but it, it the, looks good. Yeah, so I, I'm pretty happy with that side of it, but it definitely still has problems with the Steam Big Picture interface. And I don't know how much of that is just UI design, how much of it is what I can imagine is like the, the really incredible complication of communicating with a different system, having to deal with all of the devices that are plugged into that system, and then having to take inputs from what you're using on the client side, whether it's a wireless Steam yeah. Link controller or an Xbox 360 controller or a keyboard that you plugged into the thing and relaying those commands back to the host system, just dealing with weird things about like having Windows full screen and like what if you boot up a game that by default doesn't boot full screen, it boots into a window. Yeah, and like, it's like a launcher that lets you change the re resolution and Yeah, exactly, and, and, and dealing yeah. with games that maybe don't boot into the proper resolution and don't match your TV's aspect ratio or something like that, like that stuff, I don't know if it's easily solvable or if it's ever going to be solvable in terms of just making that, you know, making it feel like when you turn on a Steam Link, you're turning on a console. Like, I don't know if they can ever get to that point, but they need to get closer than they are right now just in terms of getting that stuff to work because that's when you get into the real weird issues where you can't control a game's menus because stuff's just not being relayed properly or you've lost, like you know, the, the right window isn't maximized and, and active. Um, so that, that stuff, the link, you know, the link hardware could be perfect. And if that stuff doesn't work right, it kind of doesn't matter. Yeah, so. I mean, not to give them more credit than they deserve. I mean, Steam is a, has to be by, by many orders of magnitude, a larger platform than Xbox Live. I mean, Xbox Live has apps, uh, you know, you're using it for Netflix, you're using it to talk to your friends, obviously. You have your system configuration, your games library, but just the quantity of games on Steam, I mean, uh, has to exceed what's on Xbox Live by thousands. And, uh, yeah, I mean, the aspect that, that I didn't enjoy about it immediately was was that, like, total separation between library and store where I have to either be in one or the other. I never feel like I'm sort of, it sounds strange, but they're, they're not totally disintegrated where it's like, okay, I'm looking at my library, what do I want to play? Oh, I haven't downloaded that game. I'm going to leave. I have to go to the store search for it, like find the right genre menu. I don't know. It's, I understand yeah. why, why they have to do something like that, but it was not great. Discoverability is still kind of tough. 
figuring out how to sort through things are kind of tough because they, with this big picture interface, they have to only highlight certain things, right? Because if you had a, a menu of like every possible option that you would have on a much denser monitor that you're sitting in front of with a mouse, you, you would be like scrolling through these huge oversized menus. It just would suck. But the way it is now is certainly like, okay, I have to think what genre this game might be in to try to easily find it within my library or pull up this menu and then kind of try to type in the name and like it's definitely clunky that that stuff still needs work i hope that they continue to improve it because they just recently launched this re you know redo of big picture mode um and i don't know if it's you know kind of in a 1.0 state right now or if it's in a 0.5 state and they're gonna you know be rapidly iterating on it so we'll see i'm i'm optimistic but well, we've talked about Valve's hardware long enough. Let's move on to our next topic, which is spurred by an event that just happened in, Com- in Hearthstone, which is uh, a card called Warsong Commander was nerfed. If you're not a Hearthstone fan, don't play, don't dive into it, don't worry. Three of the four people sitting at this table are not also. Um, <laughs> Tyler's played a good amount of Hearthstone. I, I played a lot more when it first came out. Uh, but I've been playing the uh, Tavern Brawl stuff sometimes just because... It's I fun. I don't have to, like... Usually I don't have to worry about what cards do I have. Can I build a competitive deck? It just kind of gives you a deck or gives you a bunch of cards. Yeah. Well, this card has been... Essentially what it did is it was able to give... For those of you who don't know, is it gave minions that you played with very low attack charge which meant they could attack the same turn they were played. And then people were exploiting this after the Black Rock Mountain update came out because there was a new card called Grim Patron where every time it survived damage, it would summon another Grim Patron. So what you could do is you could play Warsong Commander, give your Grim Patron charge, use a what's called a whirlwind effect to deal one damage to every minion. It would summon another Grim Patron. You'd do another whirlwind effect. Suddenly you had four Grim Patrons with charge, and it was just this ridiculous thing. And then you could also do it with Frothing Berserkers, which every time any minion takes damage, they'd gain a point of attack. So you would get these sometimes upwards of 70-plus damage on one turn with nothing-in-play combos. Just absurd amounts of damage. That sounds fair to me, yeah. Yeah, and, and this deck has been had been dominating, had, it was the best deck in the game, and probably the best deck had, that has ever been in the game for about six months. And the nerf today completely removes the ability for Warsong to give other minions charge, which essentially means the deck has just been, like, gutted, drawn, quartered, burned alive, and then orbital striked. Like, the deck, is, it's just gone. It is removed from the game, essentially. Um, and... The funny thing about this, and this is where I want to go with this conversation, is BlizzCon, the world championships of Hearthstone, is in like three weeks. <laughs> Two weeks, maybe. Something very low. It's November 6th and 7th, So I it's like the NBA finals are kicking off, and we've lowered the hoop by like six inches or something. <laughs> it's kind of like they removed the hoop. <laughs> it's kind of like they just well, how changed do, Well, how do we score? Game. I don't know. Figure it out. Like, <laughs> I don't know. And the question I want to ask is like, this is definitely the most drastic change that has ever come to Hearthstone. But, like, can you guys think of any other competitive games where, like, either changes this drastic have happened or changes this drastic are even possible? Like, to me, I would almost compare it with, like, the op just being removed, right? Like, from CSGO. Like, they they nerfed the op relatively recently. Yeah. And that had competitive implications. Yes. Yes. Uh, man, a lot of thoughts on this. And, 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 if, and, if, and it feeds into our earlier discussion about balance. And I, I guess I want to start off by saying, I feel like within the gaming community, and different gaming communities have different kind of histories with this and cultures around this, but I feel like we lack nuance and we lack a lot of, like a broader spectrum of language for, descri- for complaining about, <laughs> about ba- so-called balance issues where... If we are unhappy with something, like our only option is to mash a, b- a big button that says balance or OP. And you, know, yeah, you, you never see anyone on gaming forums debating like the, <laughs> the middle of the road quality of something. It is either <laughs> OP or it is like weak ass bullshit that no one, yeah, I mean, no I, one wants. Actually, that was something that I kind of noticed with the last Heroes of the Storm patch. Um, I guess there might have been a patch today, so the last, last, the one everyone added, the medic, it came out, and it was this amazing phenomenon where everyone on the Heroes of the Storm subreddit and everyone on, like, the community was just kind of like, yeah, that was a good patch. 
Like they nerfed some people, they ba- they they buffed some people, and everyone was just kind of like, yeah, good job. That was that was nice. <laughs> like, and they just moved on. And I was like, what just happened? Like, are we still on the internet? Yeah. So yeah, I mean, I also want to say it seems like you know I'm almost encouraged that I have trouble immediately thinking of big dramatic uh, patches and changes in, in other communities because I feel like most of them just kind of get washed over over time. There may be an initial negative reaction. There may be total, like, you know, uh, uproar of, oh, this is ridiculous, and you, you took away my favorite toy, basically, whatever. But eventually, people uh, seem to kind of come and, and be okay with it. Like, I can't think of an instance where, like, thousands of people seem to an, abandon a game because of, like, one class or weapon or whatever got kind of changed i know I, I think chris Thurston would probably have some nuanced thoughts on this oh yeah uh, regarding dota because uh, i i believe last year before they were going into the like the grand championships that uh to the international that there had been some recent pretty massive changes to the game or maybe i'm thinking of league of legends last year i know one of those games had gone through some pretty dramatic upheavals just in terms of the way the metagame worked and the way some specific you know champions characters worked that affected those games a lot but also like you said right now I, I can't remember the specifics of it because it does just get kind of evened out over time there's this initial reaction positive or negative about a, a really massive you know perceived massive change six months later that's just the state of the game yeah I mean the uh, I guess one it wasn't a nerf it was actually a buff that Valve gave I think uh, a year and a half or so ago they made the AUG and the SSG which are like they're guns that kind of nobody used because they were more expensive than the AK and the M4. Uh, they had better armor pen- penetration, which had some benefits, but generally speaking, they kind of took longer to, they had a longer time, time to kill, basically, than the AK and the M4. They were less effective, more expensive. Uh, and basically, Valve made their, their accuracy kind of like Call of Duty weapons because they, they had, they're the only games, the only weapons in the game other than the sniper rifles that have optics. Mm. So the AUG, you know, you, you right-click and you're in this sort of uh, 3D optics model. You have a little bit of zoom. And, you know, they basically made you extremely, like, very mobile, like, great accuracy with those optics, and you could just do all kinds of crazy stuff. And the community reacted super negatively, and they took it away. But nobody, like, swore off the game and, and, and left forever or something. And I, I don't think yeah. that's going to necessarily happen with this. I just was, like... It, it's a point of contention where, like, there are people discussing whether this nerf went too far or whether it was not harsh enough or whether it was deserved. But, like, the timing is the most interesting thing to me. That, like, and, like, it's just shocking to me that anybody would, that any developer would so fundamentally rattle the meta that close to a tournament. Oh, I, I love how aggressive that is because it creates a lot of uncertainty. It gives the, the, the pros, it puts pressure on the pros to show how good they are, to adapt and, and sort of, look at you know the, spe- the landscape of the game evaluate like you know what this really means and and do a lot of testing and, and playing in advance of you know their championship tournament yeah how, how many people would you say used this deck just like playing not necessarily pros but did you is this a deck you would encounter pretty much every time you played not every time and especially not every time in the last like month or two but for a while, it was the deck that was being played. But the interesting thing about it is that it was actually an incredibly high skill cap deck. It was very, very hard to play. So although you'd see these turns that were like 70 plus damage turns occasionally, the people that were really consistently getting that was a very small portion of the player base. Mm-hmm. But that kind of doesn't matter. It was, the reason that they nerfed, that they, people complained about it so much was because it felt awful to be going against that sort of thing where you can't do anything. Yeah, as I understand it, it basically didn't matter what you had on the board. Yeah, It's, it's could, almost like they were playing a game independently of you. If you played minions, then they'd use those minions to get extra damage effects on their Frothing Berserker. If you didn't play minions, then you wouldn't have any defenses or ways to pressure them, and they'd be playing their Frothing Berserker. Like, it was just, mm. it was just a very debilitating deck to play against. But I, I don't know. I just, I think it's... You didn't even actually really recently, you didn't see it in tournaments very often either. And I'm not entirely sure why that was, but like at the Hearthstone Americas tournament championship, which was just recently in San Francisco, like not many people brought Patron because, which is the name of the deck, Grim Patron Warrior. Um, I'm not, 
Like, I, I don't know exactly what that is. I think it's a very difficult deck to play, and it's like it's to the point where the entire meta basically shaped around it. Like, everything was built with that deck in mind. Mm. Um, and so, literally, like, and, and that's, that's one of the weird things, is even if a deck isn't built to counter it, it's built with the idea of, oh, this is the best deck right now, right? So, like, literally that deck just doesn't exist anymore, and how are every other deck going to adapt, you know? I think that's super fun. I mean, for the spectator... It's, it's always exciting when there is any kind of change leading up to a tournament, whether it's a new team got a different player or somebody left a team or, yeah, the, the op is different now in Counter-Strike. What is that going to mean for the best operas in the world who used to be the best players in Counter-Strike and now they're not quite the best players in Counter-Strike because yeah. they can't exercise those skills and, and really use them to, you know, determine matches. So, I don't know, I think that's really fun. It creates a lot of uncertainty, a lot of, like, questions and kind of creates a more open playing field rather than oh, we know this guy who plays this deck, and these are the top three players, and it's going to be one of them. Right. So, I don't know. Do you feel like that's the case for Hearthstone going into this championship? I think some people think that. I think other people are a little frustrated by it um, because there's there's people who, you know, were just like, oh, I'm not going to play Grim Patron. I don't like that deck. I'm going to practice other things. And now they are significantly more prepared than the person who was like, I'm going to become a patron master and run over tournaments with it. So, like, if there's somebody in the finals who... They won because they are the best patron warrior, patron player in the world, right? And they're at BlizzCon because of that, and now their deck doesn't work anymore? Like, that sucks, you know? I don't know if it's exactly the case, but if that is for anybody even a little bit, like, I'm a, I would be angry if I was that person, you know? And it's similar, it's, it's an interesting counterpoint to what Riot does, where when they release a new champion, they don't let it go into competitive play for, like, a month after it's been in the live environment. Hmm. They 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 play the game on older patches because they don't want to introduce anything into the game that will rock the tournament scene unexpectedly. Um, so I, I'm not necessarily saying what Blizzard did is wrong. I just think that it's a big counterpoint to how a lot of other games go about balance. Um, yeah, it'll be interesting to see. Like I, I don't follow Hearthstone at all. I don't know what other decks are out there. I don't. I haven't played it. Period. But at the same time, like, talking about this, I'm interested to see the story that comes out of the championship. What deck wins and why? Yeah. Is there anything unexpected? Does anybody sort of uh, even consider playing with the, some of the same cards from Grim Patron and sort of mutating it into something else? I don't know if that's possible, but... It's going to be an interesting tournament. No, that's that's for sure. Great. Well, you're going to BlizzCon, I Tom, am. So I'll be there to see it live. You and Tim. Cool. Oh, man. I wish I could think of some, some instances where a, a change was so dramatic that it did actually just, like drive everyone away from the game like like a a, a dig 2.0 moment or whatever the, the launch of dig was where it went from being like you know what reddit is now to like everybody's like peace out yeah. we're, can I, we're done with this can shit. i say something terrible we might be witnessing it right now with payday 2 mm, that's a good because point payday 2 just updated with microtransaction gun skins that add stat boosts to them and the community got mad see like so I'm not a big pay payday player. I, I played the first one and, and enjoyed it. I'm having trouble understanding. I, and like it's my responsibility to dig into this and, and learn more about it. I'm having under trouble understanding what the problem is in a cooperative game with cosmetic items that stat boost. Yeah, like, it's. It, it, I think it's a is fundamental. Is it purely cooperative? Yeah, there's no PvP. There's, there's no, okay. Um, and you're right that it is. I think at least less egregious. Mm -hmm. It's definitively less egregious. Any game I think that has payment, like power to pay, you can pay for power is like, that's skeezy, right? But I think there's just something about the idea of a developer locking power behind microtransactions that doesn't sit well with at least me in any context, you know? Like, maybe there's an argument to be made for like, well, DLC is that to a certain degree, right? Like. Uh, you know, this isn't PC, but the Destiny update, they just, like, you can... Or, like, or I guess in the World of Warcraft, right? Like, you can get to a higher level if you buy the DLC and the expansions, and if you don't, then you're left behind. But it's still just weird. Like, I don't know. Well, part of the issue is the Payday devs had, on record, said, we will never do this. Yeah. And then they did it. So that's a big part of the community outrage, right, for yeah. sure. Now, whether people would be 90% as pissed if that element wasn't in there, I don't know. You know, Because yeah. right. I, I think it is a thing, like Tom said, that just doesn't sit well with people. Selling, having to pay for power, and I'm sure a lot of people would probably 
not enjoy playing it if they're playing with this thing they earned and then they you know some guy gets randomly match made with them and he's got way better shit because he just dropped you know 40 bucks on it or whatever and there's a degree of whenever you finish a match in payday too uh, you get like a card and the card is either like a mask piece a gun piece or some money and now it can also be possibly a safe that you have to pay real money to open so there's there's a chance that you'll play a payday game and you don't want to spend any money on the game and you just want to enjoy the base game and you'll pay, play a game, and you'll get this item that is completely useless to you unless you open up, unless you pay real money, and you would have gotten something useful if you hadn't drawn that. So it's like, there's a little bit of, like, it's unignorable to the person who doesn't want to pay. I think there's some outrage at that, too. Know, this, this just feels, I know this isn't the case for TF2 and Counter-Strike and Dota, but those games all have drops and, and sort of, great systems. I mean, they, they kind of pioneered that stuff, and Payday is, is cribbing that. So I, I just don't get what the level of discomfort is. Like, maybe Payday 2 is like a very loot-driven game, and I'm not respecting that. And this introduction of sort of walled, you know, you have to pay to get that loot is, is really frustrating for people, but... There's also, you can... The skins, the gun skins you can get, can potentially be for guns that are in DLC you don't own. So you could pay uh, yeah. like a dollar fifty or whatever it is. I don't know the exact price to open up a safe, get a gun skin for a that you have to, then, you have to then pay five dollars <laughs> oh, to get DLC for. Oh if boy. that's true, that's really crummy. Oh yeah. I mean, on the one hand, it's been great to see that game stick around and survive for, for I think, an unexpected amount of time. Yeah. I mean, I mean, up until this moment, I feel like they've done like they've made a lot of DLC, but whatever. They it's a, like besides that, but it's, it's been a very well supported game. No, it seems like they've been in the top. 30 or so games on Steam throughout its lifespan and maybe 40 or 50,000 people playing it at any given moment, that's a great surprise. Uh, it's, it's sort of like become the new Left 4 Dead, I feel like, in a lot of ways, up until Vermintide comes out this week, maybe, uh, on Friday. But I don't know. Yeah, it's it's been interesting to see how negatively the community responds. I've, I've seen some, some bar graphs representing the number of negative reviews on Steam that have been posted that are a lot. And, uh, yeah. I guess, it'll, yeah, we're just waiting to see what the pivot is. They haven't really acknowledged this controversy so far, as far as I can tell. Uh, they haven't, like, made an official statement or retracted anything, so. Well, on that downer note, let's move on to the next downer note. Um, our very own Evan Lottie, editor-in-chief, editor and commander-in-chief, is, uh, is moving on to the next life today. Yeah. This is your last day at PC Gamer. Oh, my gosh. How you feeling? It's uh, it's bizarre, guys. Full of emotions. I asked Evan this morning if it had sunk in yet, and he was like, "Well, <laughs> I didn't sleep much last night." <laughs> oh so. man, it's it's really strange. I mean, I I haven't really absorbed it yet. I like I said at the start of this show, I've been here for more than seven years now. My first job out of college, and it's, I mean, what can I say? It's been incredible. You know what what kid growing up. Reading game magazines doesn't want to... I, I read, grew up re reading PC Gamer, and one of the editors back then was a guy named Rob Smith. Rob Smith is my DM now. He's, <laughs> he's, my, he's my dungeon master. I played D&D &D with him last weekend. Like, what an insane dream, you know? Um, so I feel, I feel like I'm, I'm, in a lot of ways, leaving behind my dream job, which is super sad, and I'm leaving behind a great group of guys like you, a great group of people that have contributed a lot and will continue to and I'm super proud of what we're doing I mean th this show is super fun I'm, I'm glad we, we've gotten to a point where we're on Twitch every week doing a podcast as well uh, we're doing stuff like the PC gaming show like uh, at E3 and we'll be doing next year 2016 maybe we'll be doing an XCOM that's fun not XCOM Gamescom <laughs> <laughs> this is how emotional I am I can't keep uh, can't keep things straight but there, uh, there could be an XCOM eventually <laughs> XCOM 2 is, is big and Wes has basically single handedly propped up all of our hardware coverage over the past year plus like delivering all our guides and video cards and monitors and everything else and that's been amazing to watch so you know on the one hand I'm sad but I'm super happy that like I'm, I'm at least leaving at this this peak of uh, you know what PC Gamer's been? We didn't have a website until 2010. <laughs> that's, that's crazy. Like, uh, as it turns out, PC Gamers, some of them use the internet. No joke. Some of them read about computer games. Uh, so that's nice. Uh, and the website's doing amazing. Like, we're growing every year. We're writing new stuff, like, trying out new stuff every year. That's That's been awesome. And, like, more than anything, it's been really, really cool and, and rewarding to be in a place where 
it feels like any of us on the team can just have an idea and do it, you know, like have permission and trust to do it without a lot of like layers and bureaucracy and approvals. Like, I don't know, if you work at a big company, like you know what I'm talking about basically, but we can try out stuff like the LPC. We built this $10,000 computer and just had fun with it basically. So that's that's been fantastic to, to be in a context like that and to be trusted to, you know, just launch stuff, do stuff. Um, and man, I don't know. I feel like you, know, you guys want me to tell stories or yeah, something yeah, at this some point. Story <laughs> highlights or, or low points to to talk about. How many PAXs and how many conventions? Like how many E3s have you been to? All of those. You have like a mound of badges and like lanyards and that sort of thing. I have enough lanyards to kill a small animal. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> maybe a large animal. Yeah. Uh, I mean, PAX is one of the first things I, I was assigned to when I first came to PC Gamer in like July or August 2008. And I was just, like, sent off to Seattle, like, figure it out. Like, we've never been to a PAX before, so, like, let us know how it is. And <laughs> I don't really know what I did there. I, I survived. Um, Dragon Age Origins was my first cover story. That was also, like, October, so, like, shortly after that. So I went, I got, went up to Bioware in Edmonton. That was, like, my first big trip uh, and got to interview Ray and Greg in, in their conference room, you know, the, the, the former the founders of Bioware who have now left Bioware, and that was... They now, like, golf and make wine or something. I don't know it makes me... Yeah, be, beer, beer enthusiasts. So, close. So, like, you know, PC Gamer has, has always been this place, and I think, I don't know, maybe you can reflect on this a little bit, Tom, where we just, we trust people, and we, like, thrust them into these kind of, you know, bigger than their experience level positions, where I'm, like, interviewing the creators of Bioware in my first month or so on the job, and and writing a cover story and, and, you know, having a lot of good guidance and help from all of my editors and bosses throughout the time to, to get that done. But Were you, a, like, a staff writer at that time? Were you an intern? Or? Associate editor associate was editor. my first title, yeah. Yeah. Man, and, yeah, I think um, within the first year, I also, like, I think November, I can't remember the exact release date, but I was at Valve helping review Left 4 Dead, and we had flown out, like, one of our UK editors and uh, Norm, who's our housemate, then worked at Maximum PC. He was there with us. So I got to be at Valve and basically land party Left 4 Dead and, and evaluate together. And, I mean, just imagine your, your first experience playing Left 4 Dead, right? I mean, I think that was a really precious time for a lot of people, for enthusiasts of that game, where it was so fresh and you're discovering it with your friends and doing that inside Valve for the first time having like valve help you out and sort of explain concepts and stuff like that but that was really special um man what else gosh it, it's been fun being on camera it's been fun interviewing folks like cliff Bazinski, and uh, i think like one of the things i'll miss most is being in events like pax tyler like you've been a part of this too especially where we have this total permission to talk to anybody literally anybody on the floor we can just sort of well we have this microphone that says pc gamer on it and you know what that means we can just shove it in your face and ask you <laughs> questions like that's an amazing we're a little more polite than that. Uh, yeah it's true <laughs> we're not gotcha pax journalism or whatever but uh, that's been really special to sort of have that power to roam the floor and be like that looks cool like we're going to put that in front of our audience that's been super fun. I hope you guys can sort of continue that tradition. But uh. So I'm curious, because we've talked on the show a couple times now about how um, there's just a ridiculous amount of games coming out right now on Steam and that sort of thing. Yeah. Like, can you enlighten us, like how, was, like, how was it even three years ago covering, like, how would you go about covering an indie game, right? Or, like, it, was it just simpler or was it more difficult? Yeah, I, I feel like I really stood, I feel like I've really been in a position to witness that transition. Of uh, the industry of gaming media in general, it's it's been fascinating. Um, we had demo discs in our magazine. We were shipping CDs to you in 2008, and I think as late as 2010, and maybe. DVDs at some point, right? DVDs, yeah. yeah, of course. So I think when I started, we may have still had an indie column in the magazine. So mm -hmm. we were still sort of like breaking out. I mean, this is like a criticism, honestly. Like indie games are sort of these like fascinations, and uh, they're just kind of out there and look at these cool weirdos making these, these dreamers not working at Activision and EA and I mean there's a lot of great stuff and there was stuff like World of Goo kind of pioneering and and setting the stage for indie games to come but it, it, it was definitely not like it is today in the sense that indie, ga indie games have total parity with with AAA games are being talked about in the same way I mean some of the best creators in the business have gone independent obviously 
you know, if you want to talk about Star Wars as an independent game, we can dig into that. But uh, and you see people like Steve Gaynor on stage at you know the like Sony press conference, like playing playing his game on stage, and Lauren Lanning playing his game on stage and stuff like that. For sure. Yeah, and it's it's been interesting to see just our business evolve as well, and like uh, the act of writing about games in general. I think you know previews and reviews are, are kind of less relevant than they were way back in the day when you know when I was growing up. That magazine was my my window in, in the gaming world. It was you know that and my conversation with my friends about what they what they were playing and what their friends were were playing. Like that was my source of information basically and insight. Where with you know betas and demos and, and twitch and stuff like that it's so easy to get knowledge about games it's so easy to get information it's so at our fingertips and like our our work at pc gamer has had to be more about expressing enthusiasm for the culture and, and doing stuff like buying guides of stuff uh, like hardware and, and you know putting a lot of resources into that and developing events and you know developing sort of our you know, authority and our insight and opinion and sort of focusing in on that and, and being a, like commentators more than evaluators and sort of points of access for stuff that's like very, become very, very accessible for people. So there's been a, a couple questions. I don't know if you want to talk about where you're going yet. Or... Oh, uh, well, I'm staying in the game industry, which is, is great. Uh, I'm definitely going to see you guys at other events and packs like that. So that's refreshing. I'm not going to talk about where I'm going yet. There was speculation that you were opening a coffee shop called Evan's Lattes. <laughs> I've been hearing that one since about fourth grade on the playground. So really? So uh -huh. thanks. So, uh, not the first. Uh, but no, I'm not going far. I am moving out of San Francisco, which is strange and, and weird. But Because uh, you've lived here basically as long as you worked yeah. at PCG, right? Yeah. So I'm, I'm getting out of here in like a week or so, which is crazy. Um, but no, I'm not going into like... <laughs> the, the laundromat business or something. <laughs> That's a shame because you have a name made for coffee shops That's true. there. Do you, do you have any any uh, horror stories or low points you want to share from you know without implicating anyone <laughs> publicly? I don't know. I mean, I feel like I haven't really. It's it's hard for me to reflect on that stuff yet because I need, almost need more distance from it. But you know, it's working on a magazine is really something special. It's uh, it's like having a final project in school every month or 13 times a year, I guess, and sharing that with your friends and all, you know, you have this four week cycle, you have a definitive deadline, you get to hold something physical in your hands at the end of it. But along the way, it's just lots of uh, unexpected, you know, just like uh, when we had issues where we, we think, a, a, we think we know what's going to be on our cover that month and it pulls out at the last moment. Uh, whoops, you know, what, what do we put on the cover? We have six days to decide it and write it and put it out there for people. That's been fun. I think you've written a few cover stories in, like, a night. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure that's happened at least I mean, I, I definitely, oh, yeah, so Wolfenstein, uh, the 2009 Wolfenstein by Activision, I definitely slept over in this office in a room not far from here, <laughs> just slept in the building uh, <laughs> after writing until 2 a.m. or something because we had to get it done. It was It was one of those replacement covers where, we had to get really creative. I, th I think our editor-in-chief at the time, Gary Steinman, who now works at Bethesda, was like, okay, I can't even remember what the original cover was supposed to be. We were like, we need to do this. You're reviewing, like, what, what else do we have? I'm like, well, I'm reviewing Wolfenstein, and I like it a lot. He's like, it's crazy enough to work. Like, can you do it? I'm like, yeah, let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, and we, we, didn't, like, we didn't have access to art. We didn't have, like, official art from wow. uh, Activision that was usable. It was, we didn't have, like, ready to go cover art in like two days obviously so they're like what can we do and we found this like weird piece of concept art that like a modeler at activision had done and we sort of converted it and it's like basically a big skull face with the, you know like nazi paraphernalia on it but it ended up turning out pretty well i was really happy with it i remember it opening with this like it was like a letter to bj blaskowitz or it was something really strange and high concept it was like a portfolio embedded in the uh in the opening spread anyway <laughs> magazines are super fun and I, i'm like i'm super proud but, you know people joke and, and kind of uh, poke at the death of print and stuff like that and you know it's no secret that the internet is the future but we're publishing a magazine in 2015 about computer games that's an amazing achievement that we set ourselves up to do that and we should be super super proud of that in addition to being the biggest website about pc games in the world like super super happy that we've been able to continue that 20 year old tradition now i think print will will have a somewhat of a rebound too i mean i think it stopped its 
like just terrible, you know, mountain esque decline oh, at yeah. this point and kind of leveled off. But I think it'll have the same thing eventually that like vinyl has where you know the there will be a group of of people who decide oh i really like this physical sensation of touching this thing and oh man this looks so cool on a bookshelf and after you know a decade or two of our tendency to like get a kindle and throw out all our books and then occasionally someone's going to pick up a book and they're gonna go i kind of like having this thing and then i think that's going to happen with print i think more people will will move back towards magazines and stuff over over the next decade. Yeah. I hope so, anyway. I think some of my other fond memories, real quick, are, ju- are just sort of discovering games at, at, at their outset and, and becoming, you know, without sounding like... We definitely never approach things with the intent to like we're not we're not here to market games or, or boost them up or anything. But naturally, when we're passionate about a game, we want to tell you about it, we want to write about it. So games like DayZ, uh, Red Orchestra, Killing Floor 2... Arma, Arma 2, Arma 3, like really that for me. Uh, Dungeons of Dreadmore was one as well where I, I sort of caught them, most of them like really in their lifespans and, and I think really helped evangelize like those specific experiences. Daisy in particular, I think I caught like really early when it was at the very earliest mod stage and it was that experience of, you know, basically being first, you know, in, in the comments or whatever. It's like really <laughs> special because you get to see that whole spectrum of, Daisy became this massive phenomenon that sparked a huge genre that we're still seeing seeing just grow and mutate in all these weird, interesting ways. But seeing, you know, I still remember being at uh, E3 and and meeting Dean Hall for the first time and, and like, finding, you know, being with the Bohemia guys and, like, scrambling to find a restaurant on my phone to, like, sit down with them because I was afraid, like, Kotaku or some other website was going to grab an interview with them or something and you know seeing like the the way Dean Hall dresses change over time and stuff like that like <laughs> at, like as his game changed and has like his his career changed uh it's it's cool that I get to sort of be an observer uh for the larger trends and, and issues I guess Tyler you have any stories to share from having worked with Evan certainly he, longer than than Tom and I have embarrass him live He's embarrassing Evan stories uh, I can't think of any embarrassing Evan stories I don't think Evan uh, is ever ever embarrassing <laughs> he's always uh, you know been the level headed uh, when we've needed someone level headed the most like uh, I think there was one time we put together a special issue in one week oh was it the Minecraft one <laughs> or I don't maybe it was and uh, I don't know at times like that when we're all in the office you know eating pizza at 7 or 8 o'clock at night <laughs> or later you know copy editing a bunch of pages and I don't think I ever have seen uh, seen you be uh, flustered or, or uh, yeah, or lose your, uh, your cool even in, you know, situations that are pretty terrible. Well, <laughs> except when we're playing Left 4 Dead together or something. That's true. And Evan, I'm like... Evan is a, he is a, uh, he's commander of, uh, of his, his troops. Well, real quick, while we're, we're thinking of more ways to embarrass Evan and hopefully make him cry, if you do have any questions for us, use the at PC Gamer in the chat, uh, and we'll we'll answer them if we can. Um, and if you are listening on the podcast or on YouTube, then come watch at twitch.tv slash PC Gamer on 1 p.m. Pacific time on Tuesdays, and you will be able to ask your questions in chat live. Um, How exciting. But yeah, I'm really excited about what's next for you guys. I mean, 2016 is going to be awesome. I, I have a Wait, sense We have of, to keep doing this after you uh, leave? I'm afraid so. <laughs> it's not just over. Uh, I, don't think I have plans tomorrow. I... We haven't mentioned it yet, but we're, PC Gamer is moving into a new office in downtown San Francisco. That's going to, you know, this new office that we're, yeah. the whole company is moving into, going to have a new energy, kind of new scene for the first time in like yet. eight years. This is the only corner <laughs> of our current office that looks like an office anymore. Everything else is being... It's yeah, chaos. If you turn the camera around 180 degrees, <laughs> it would just be like hobo town. Just everything else is just like empty desks and piles of stuff everywhere. If you, this is just our one preserved little corner. If you guys heard some bumping about 20 minutes ago, that was actually they were taking the like logo of the company off of the outside of the building. Oh, shit. So... <laughs> It's it's chaos. Evan's um, taking it with him when he leaves. Yeah, I mean, Somebody burn burn and pillage, right? Nemo ate at night. Eight at eight night. Asks, what's your favorite article you wrote while you were here? Oh man, oh a lot. I'm oh, imagining, gosh. but you know, I did one in 2011. I think it only appeared in print, and I basically I found a community like Shack Tactical. If you're familiar with that, where we're like 
the hardcorest of the hardcore Arma guys. And I basically did like an embedded journalism thing with them in, in Arma 2 where I was an unarmed reporter in one of their like 60 player multiplayer matches, uh, like cooperative matches against AI. It was actually a, like a reenactment of this like famous Vietnam battle that I was unfamiliar with up until that point. And the experience of, I mean, that, that's like, that's like, you know, you can't think of a more Evan article, God. <laughs> uh, but you know, like riding in helicopters with those guys and embracing the drama of it and basically being given permission by my editor in chief, uh, Gary Steinman, to write this like six or eight page feature, you know, kind of war report on, on this battle, on, on the people that are so passionate, uh, that are like the most passionate they can be about this type of game that are so supportive of each other's fun. It just sort of completely connected with like my ideals as a gamer in terms of like user created experiences and like, and sort of like creating your own fun and supporting uh, the camaraderie of, of, and fun of the people around you that you're playing with and building your own experience within PC gaming. That's like absolutely, absolutely innate to the platform, but also just being able to do what, do what I want and sort of draw on maps and do a lot of interesting visual stuff. Uh, so that was fun. I had a lot of fun researching the, the recent story I did on, uh, $400 knives in Counter-Strike and, and just the, the way the microtransactions we were talking about the er earlier have affected uh, the community at large, how they've sort of empowered in a lot of ways uh, the, the competitive scene and, and added, you know, directly put money in the game and the positive and, and a little bit negative effects that that's had. Actually, just to jump off of that real quick, I yeah. am I Ian Animator uh, brought up in the chat that actually today... Overkill, the payday devs, announced that the drills that you could open the safes with are now available in the same drops that the safes are. So you can get those skins without paying any money now. Also, the microtransactions and everything is still in there, but it is available. Those things and those gun skins are available now as of today without any payment, if you want, which I think probably will do a little bit to, to sate the community, but there's still some anger about yeah. that. Well, thanks for the update, Ian. Yeah. Um, so a few more questions. Uh, there's a fewer high pro, well, James says who was the best intern, but we're not getting into that fight. <laughs> um, so there's, uh, Panzerg 2 asks, there are a few higher profile games coming out this week, Tales of Zestiria, Sword Coast Legends, Rebel Galaxy, mm. uh, any of those planned reviews? Are we reviewing any of those? All of those. All of those, yeah. I'm excited well, for Rebel Galaxy. All uh, of those and more. But, geez, there's a lot of games. Um, so... Yeah, we don't have Tales of Zestiria yet. Um, when we do, well, it's actually out, which is which is weird. So right, he, was it out? It's out, out. Like on the let's let's have our editorial <laughs> meeting. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, it's it was they okay, like sorry, they yeah. bumped up the release or something. That's right. Okay, yeah, they haven't sent out press. No, no, but we'll we'll code, whatever. Yeah. We'll just buy it or whatever. But uh, yeah, that's definitely planned for review. We also have to think about. Um, Tap the table. Oh, Rebel Galaxy or Sword yeah, Coast? Yeah, that's, that's in, in progress. So Sword mm -hmm. Coast, or it better be. And uh, no, what's this Friday? Vermintide. Vermintide is yeah. also one to review, but uh, yep. I don't think we'll be able to play the full version of it until Friday. Yeah. Until launch, yeah. There's only so. a few levels right now. Yeah. Um, Durante is doing a, an article on Tales of Zestiria. Durante. So we'll get, get to the bottom of the port, the quality of the port. Just had to that. say his name twice. Uh, Durante. Durante. <laughs> it's a great name. Just imagine like a Mexican guitar twang, <laughs> twanging as, as I say that. Uh, tearing it up, son. This isn't a question, but says, Evan, thanks for writing so heavily about the DayZ mod in 2012. Got me hooked on the game and still love it. Oh, thanks, dude. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a great experience and, uh, you know, a flawed one in a lot of ways here and there. I, you know, it's been interesting to see that game evolve over time and sort of, you know, they've had to completely uh, redo a lot of Arma's infrastructure in the engine, which wasn't built for a like competitive survival game. It has a lot of different needs technically, but uh, yeah, thank you. That, that means a lot. So are, are you still going to be shootering, I imagine, then? You oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, for sure. You know, to some extent, I'm, I'm excited about exploring new genres. Uh, t to some extent... You know, being here does create not a pressure, but like a, a need to know what's happening in in my specialties. You know, in in shooters and Counter Strike in particular. Like, I need to be able to talk to you guys about what the most recent patch is every week. And I like I like doing that, and that's awesome. But to some extent, it discourages me from playing stuff like The Witcher. You know, which I'm curious about, but 
it's like an 80 hour commitment, you know, away from my specialization that's gonna weaken my my ability to report on stuff like Counter-Strike and shooters. So yeah, looking forward to that. I'm gonna play a ton of Rainbow Six when that comes out and Fallout for sure. So that, that'll, I think that'll be my holiday kind of bought and sold. Keenan Weaver says, hi Evan, we met in a game, a video game seven years ago. Who would have known a video game would build a friendship like this? I know you'll do good wherever you go. Go Team F you forever. Oh, that's really nice. <laughs> yeah, Keenan was one of the, you know, we first met at PAX. Thanks, Keenan. Uh, that's That's been one of the greatest parts of being here with PC Gamer. Like, uh, we're less acti- active with it now. You know, we've, we've kind of tried to reinvigorate this. But uh, when I first came here, we had like a TF2 server, and that was like our, our big meeting point for a lot of the staff, us and Maximum PC, and had a lot of regulars on that server, a lot of like friendships that were formed there, and uh, it was, it's great to be able to continue that over time. Uh, Keen and I actually play a bunch of Counter-Strike together. We were earlier this year, and I don't know, it kind of makes me want to reflect on this is something maybe you guys can do an article on, because I don't have to anymore, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but servers are kind of dead as a concept. You know, servers as the, the, the sort of pub, so to speak, where uh, the, the server itself has a personality, has certain settings, has like a map rotation that it likes. I mean, even TF2, which is like a very server-driven game, is, is kind of like puts its matchmaking like directly in your face and sort of buries the server browser. Counter-Strike, yeah, they're there, but who, who uses the server browser? Like very small subsets of people. Like there are very few games that are really putting that experience as like the primary multiplayer experience where like hey go you know go out there i mean minecraft i guess is one of them like go out there and find a a server and that being on that specific server really means something and has a history and has a group of people that you'll meet with over time and i never thought of the server as basically cheers and now i'm so sad (laughs) to have missed my shot to be to be norm on on some server (laughs) (laughs) where everybody knows your handle yeah you missed the opportunity where everyone knows your username. Come on. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, unfortunately, I think we are running short of time. Um, but we didn't make Evan cry. I'm real disappointed about yes. that. I guess we just got to sock you in the gut and, and get those tears <laughs> going. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us. We will be back. Most of us will be back next Tuesday. Um, <laughs> 1 p.m. Pacific time, live on Twitch, as per usual. The form will probably be a little different since yeah. we're, we're in our office transition. Like we mentioned, the set will not be will not be here uh, a week from now. Yeah, as Evan so. mentioned, we're moving into the city. So this is the last show for Evan and the last show for this set. Um, and then we will be kind of in flux for the next week or two, maybe. But we'll still be doing the show. Um, and... It just might be in a foreign live, location. Live from Tom's house. Live from my house, yeah. Um, I could do the, bring the Miss Pac-Man machine in that we got from the office. It'd be great. Um, and Evan, hopefully we will have you back on. Yeah. Not as an editor, but as a whatever you might be doing in the future. Uh, king of, of laundromats or yeah. something. <laughs> you know, like whatever venture I'm pursuing. Yeah, but thanks for everything. You know, thanks for, for reading my stuff, reading the stuff we edit, and, and being a great audience. It's been total privilege to, you know, put up stories for you guys and, and uh, work with you guys. So going to miss you a bunch, but glad that I'm not transitioning to some, you know, Russian enterprise or, or some weird obscure industry. I'm still in the gaming industry, so I'll definitely be on Twitch and be hanging out with you guys and... Well, I think I, I think I speak for all of us when I say thank you for being an awesome editor in chief. Uh, so there we go. Couldn't ask for a better one. It's Thanks. true. Well, thank you very much, everyone, and we will see you next Tuesday. <laughs>